Hey everybody, it's Dr. Paul Thomas with Plum Health DPC, and today I'm talking about the issues around coronavirus. Today it's Monday, March 16th, and there's a lot of information out there around the coronavirus, and I just want to address what's going on currently and discuss why we're having bars close and restaurants close and limiting gatherings to 10 people or fewer in some cases, um, and everything that's going on with the coronavirus. I'm going to address some of those concerns today. I've also gotten maybe 100 questions about the coronavirus, so I'm going to try to answer as many of them as I can, some of the more pertinent questions. And we're going to start with this graph called flattening the curve. And so this is really about slowing the spread of the virus so the rate of infection doesn't increase. Um, so basically, we practice this thing called social distancing right now, where we want to stay about six feet away from anybody else and not do anything that we don't need to do. The things that we need to do are like going to the grocery store, going to the pharmacy, visiting the doctor, checking in on loved ones, things like that. Otherwise, we want to practice some social distancing so we don't infect other people in the community. If we're able to do that, we can flatten the curve. So if we don't enact these policies of social distancing, if we don't close movie theaters and restaurants and bars and things like that, we're going to have a huge spike of people who get infected with the coronavirus. And the issue with that is that we have a finite number of hospital beds. We only have about, some say 800,000 hospital beds. Other people say 925,000 hospital beds for a population of 300 million plus. So when you look at that, you know, that infection rate has to remain pretty low so that we don't saturate those beds. Because what had happened in other countries, we're going to go to a different graph here. If you're looking at other countries like Italy, um, which is what you see with this orange line, the rate of um, infection was so great that they ran out of hospital beds for people and they were in effect rationing care for folks. And therefore, the um, infection rate went really high and the mortality rate went really high. So... Um, there are a lot more deaths in Italy than in Korea, which is this blue line, because they reached this critical mass where there weren't enough hospital beds for all the people who were infected. Again, who should be tested for the coronavirus? Anybody who has a fever, cough, shortness of breath, and contact with somebody who's had the coronavirus or has traveled recently. Now that's changing because there's been so much community spread and community involvement where people are passing the infection around in the community. There have been positive cases here in Michigan of people who haven't traveled. So uh, more and more we're going to be testing people who don't meet the criteria of uh, traveling abroad. But it, you should be aware that um, there are a limited number of tests, and I'm going to show you that now. Um, this came up out of Vox. They were showing tests per millions of people. And in the United States, apparently we only have 23 tests for every 1 million people, which is horrendously low. And this speaks to the United States not being prepared for a disease of this magnitude and not ramping up testing capabilities when we had an opportunity. So we had an opportunity going back to January where we saw this getting bad in China and worsening over time. And then we saw this worsen in Italy, but still we didn't really take massive action to prepare in terms of getting tests ready. And now you're seeing us where we are now with limited amount of testing capability. Um, and that may really hurt our ability to, to triage people effectively, uh, to treat people effectively for the coronavirus. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was the effect of um, staying in place and social distancing. And I thought this Washington Post article was phenomenal. If you have access to this, I think all of their uh, coverage for coronavirus is free on the Washington Post and the New York Times. So go check this out. So um, here they're showing the number of cases over time, and they're showing this really big spike. And this is also what happened in Italy. We're tracking with Italy in terms of the number of cases. I'll actually show this COVID-19 cases in Italy versus the USA. This is on a logarithmic scale, so don't be fooled. In this graph, it looks like a linear growth, but it's more of an exponential growth, as you see in this curve. But it just shows you that the number of cases increasing over time, uh, and we're trending with those cases in Italy, 
which is concerning because we all saw what happened in Italy with not having enough ventilators or hospital beds for those who were infected. So I wanted to walk through this because it's a fantastic demonstration. This is what happens when you have no social distancing and no quarantines in place. You're going to see people who are healthy, which are the blue dots, gradually become infected and turn into these sick dots. And the issue here is that um, you have this really high spike in new cases, and that's going to overwhelm our existing hospital systems, and we won't be able to keep up with the demand, and people will die because there's not enough ventilators. Gradually, you see everybody going to the pink, which is a recovered case. All right, so that's the first case. The other case is doing a quarantine, um, which only works so well as long as people don't break through the quarantine. But as we know, it's human nature. It's really hard to restrict people and their movements. So what you're seeing here is people breaking over this quarantine barrier, and then suddenly you're going to have a really high spike again of new cases, and potentially that could overwhelm your hospital system and hospital capacity. Um, because it's hard to keep people, are you going to keep them where they work or you keep them where they live? It's really hard to make that determination. So just like the previous example of not having any preventive strategies, you're still going to get a high spike. It just might take a little bit longer. The third case is when you have social distancing and the criteria they put around this was um, a quarter of the population continues to move around. So 75% of people are staying in place and only 25% of the population is moving around. So this is where you basically stay at home, you hunker down, you don't interact with um, anybody else for 75% of the population. And you can see with this, you get a nice um, gradual increase uh, where you're having a manageable number of cases present to the hospital or the emergency department. Um, and that won't overwhelm our hospital capacity. And then the final example is if you only have one in eight people moving around. So like, I don't know, what is that? 16, 17% of people who are moving around and then, you know, close to 90% or like 85% of people staying in place. So they're not exposing other people to the virus. And this is what that simulation looks like. Very low levels of people who are getting infected and therefore you don't have uh, our hospital systems being overwhelmed by sick people. And then they did this cool thing where they have all these simulations uh, at your disposal so you can see where it's a free-for-all, an attempted quarantine, a moderate distancing, and extensive distancing. So, you know, our goal at, from a public health perspective, and as a primary care physician, I'm advocating for this as well, is that we have people stay in place and not interacting with people. We have this extensive distancing tactic so that fewer people become infected um, and people become infected over a longer period of time. So you don't overwhelm the hospital system with sick people. All right, so those are that's that for now. We're gonna go into the question and answer portion of this. What's the most common presentation of the coronavirus? So the most common presentation is a one week prodrome of muscle aches, uh, malaise, generally not feeling well, cough, and a low-grade fever. This generally leads to more severe trouble breathing in the second week of illness. And then how's the presentation of coronavirus different from the presentation of influenza? Coronavirus tends to have a gradual onset, whereas influenza tends to have a sudden onset. And coronavirus tends to have a cough and have a fever, whereas influenza tends to have a fever, chills, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. All right, I think that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, this is a lot of information. I'm going to write some more on our blog. Um, I hope this helps you to understand the coronavirus epidemic better and to better protect yourself and your loved ones. For now, stay safe. Wash your hands. Uh, before you touch your T-zone, that's your eyes, nose, and mouth, wash your hands well. Before you eat food or prepare food, wash your hands very well. And uh, as best you can, stay at home and avoid interacting with Older adults or adults who are vulnerable, like those who are, um, who have had transplants, those people who have a history of tuberculosis or uh, lung cancer or heart disease or stroke, those people are going to be really vulnerable. So we want to avoid giving them the uh, coronavirus. The best single piece of advice I can give you is to act as if you have the coronavirus and you're trying not to give it to anybody else. That's all I'm going to say for today. Um, my best to everybody and stay safe out there.